Welcome to the third module in this introductory series on FMCW radars. This video is going to be a deep dive into velocity estimation. And like in the case of range estimation in the first module, we are going to be looking at things such as the maximum measurable velocity and uh, the velocity resolution. So the kind of questions that we're going to try and answer in this module are, uh, you have a radar and you have an object in front of the radar. How does the radar estimate the velocity of this object? And uh, this is going to be um, a recap from uh, what we've learned and what we've seen in module two. Uh, what if there are multiple objects, uh, perhaps at the same range from the radar, but with different relative velocities? How close can the velocities of two equi range objects get and still be resolved by the radar? Is there a limit on the maximum measurable velocity um, on, in a radar? Uh, like in the earlier uh, modules, we are going to start with a quick uh, recap of some uh, Fourier transform concepts. So far, we've been talking about Fourier transforms on a continuous time signal. Similar concepts are also valid for discrete signals. So here you have a discrete signal consisting of a phaser rotating at a constant rate of omega radians per, sec per sample. So between any two samples, uh, this phaser has rotated by omega. So we will use the term uh, angular, discrete angular frequency or uh, sometimes just frequency to refer to this omega. Uh, note that each of these phasers actually represents a complex number. So another equivalent representation of the sequence would be um, this particular uh, mathematical representation that you see here. A Fourier transform or a discrete Fourier transform to be exact of the sequence would result in a single peak in the frequency domain at the discrete frequency omega 1. And here I show this word FFT, um, which is just an efficient algorithm for computing this discrete Fourier transform. Now, if this discrete sequence consisted of two phasers instead of one, as shown here, where you have the blue phaser uh, rotating at uh, an, a discrete angular frequency of, say, omega 1, and the red phaser rotating at a discrete angular frequency of, say, omega 2, the Fourier transform of this discrete sequence would uh, uh, would actually have two peaks uh, at uh, discrete frequencies of omega 1 and omega 2, respectively. How far apart do two frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2, have to be for them to show up as separate peaks in the Fourier transforms? So here you have two phasers rotating with slightly different frequencies of omega 1 and omega 2, such that over n samples, the second phaser has traversed a half a cycle of pi radians more than the first phaser. So in this example, omega 1 is 0, omega 2 is pi by n. So over n samples, the cumulative angle um, of uh, uh, omega 2 uh, with respect to omega 1 will be pi radians or half a cycle. And as you can see here, uh, that is clearly not sufficient to resolve these two objects in the frequency domain. Here you have the same two phases, but now observed over a longer time period. We now have two n samples instead of n samples previously. Over these two n samples, the second phaser has traversed a full additional cycle compared to the first phaser. And as you can see, the two, the two frequencies are now clearly resolved in the Fourier, uh, in the frequency domain. So the takeaway here is longer the sequence length, better the resolution. And in general, a sequence length of a sequence of length n can separate angular frequencies that are separated by more than 2 pi by n radians per sample. Let's take a moment to compare the resolution criteria for discrete and continuous signals. Recall from the last module that for a continuous signal, two frequencies can be resolved as long as their separation delta f is more than 1 by t hertz or 1 by t cycles per second, t being the observation window. For discrete signals, as we stated in the last slide, two discrete frequencies can be resolved as long as their separation delta omega is more than 2 pi by n radians uh, per sample. So note the unit here, uh, radians per sample. 
which is actually the same as 1 by n cycles per sample since each cycle is uh, 2 pi by n radians. So now if you look at these two equations, uh, the correspondence between the discrete and the continuous case really comes through. In one case, the resolution is inversely proportional to the length expressed in the uh, observation time t and in, a, in the other case to the length expressed in the number of observed samples n. So I think we now have all the tools to understand how an FMCW radar can measure velocity. The basic idea is the following. You transmit two chirps um, separated by a time of Tc. The range FFTs corresponding to each of these chirps will have peaks in the same location but with differing phase. The measured phase difference omega between these two, uh, between the phases of these two peaks will directly correspond to the motion of the object. And note that if the velocity of the object is v, the object would have moved a distance vtc uh, during this time period tc. So uh, this is the equation here where the phase difference between the uh, the peaks between the faces of the peaks corresponding to these these two transmitted chirps is given by 4 pi times the distance that the object has moved during that period divided by lambda and then rearranging this equation you can directly uh, estimate the velocity from this measured phase difference. So the uh, takeaway here is that the phase difference measured across two consecutive chirps can be used to estimate the uh, velocity of the object. Is there a limit on the maximum velocity that can be measured using the technique that we just described? Note that the method relies on a phase difference measurement, which is unambiguous only as long as this difference is within plus or minus 180 degrees or plus or minus pi radians. This is illustrated in these series of figures here. Uh, for example, if we visualize the phaser motion across two chirps, for positive velocities, you could visualize the phaser moving anti-clockwise. Likewise, for negative velocities, you could visualize the phaser moving clockwise. Now, if the movement in the clockwise or anti-clockwise direction is more than 180 degrees, there would be an ambiguity. For example, in this illustration, uh, one cannot conclude if the phaser moved by an angle A in the anti-clockwise direction or an angle B in the clockwise direction. So, unambiguous measurement of velocity requires that the phase change across the two chirps is less than pi, which means uh, we have this expression for the phase change uh, from the previous uh, uh, material. Uh, this expression must be less than pi, which means that the, uh, which gives you an uh, expression for the um, uh, maximum unambiguous uh, velocity that can be measured. So the takeaway here is that the maximum uh, relative velocity that can be measured by two chirps spaced Tc apart is given by this expression. Um, so you can see here that uh, a higher Vmax requires that the chirps be closely spaced. So we've just seen um, how one can measure the velocity of a single object in front of the radar. And I hope it's clear uh, that the same method uh, can be applied for multiple objects in front of the radar as long as they are at different ranges from the radar. But what about if there are multiple objects uh, at the same range from the radar? Um, so in this example here, you have two objects uh, in front of the radar which are at the same range from the radar but have different velocities v1 and v2 um, relative to the radar. So. Um, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, there is going to be a single peak in the range FFT, you know, corresponding to these two chirps that I would transmit. Um, but the phaser of, at that peak is going to have components from both objects. Uh, so the simple phase comparison technique that we described earlier will not work. The reason being that um, the phases here uh, have components from uh, the uh, velocities of uh, both these objects. Uh, so what would be the solution? One solution is to transmit a series of equispaced chirps uh, instead of just two chirps.
And uh, so here you have n equispaced chirps. And uh, building on our earlier discussion, the range FFTs corresponding to each of these chirps would have peaks at identical locations. But the discrete sequence corresponding to the phases of these peaks would have uh, two rotating phases um, uh, rotating at frequencies of say omega 1 and omega 2 um, corresponding to the two velocities v1 and v2. Um, so an FFT on this discrete sequence would then show two peaks um, at uh, corresponding to um, discrete uh, angular frequencies of uh, omega 1 and omega 2 respectively. And once and then you know having measured omega 1 and omega 2 you can then back calculate the velocities um, using these expressions that we've uh, seen before. Before we move on, let's clarify a few terms. So this FFT here, which is done across the chirps, is typically called a Doppler FFT in literature. And this sequence of equispaced chirps over which the Doppler FFT is being performed uh, is called a frame. So the basic unit of uh, um, an FMCW radar, the basic transmission unit of an FMCW radar is really uh, this frame. What is the velocity resolution capability of the Doppler FFT? That is, what is the minimum separation between V1 and V2 for them to show up as two peaks in the Doppler FFT? It turns out that deriving an expression for the velocity resolution is quite simple and analogous to what we did in module 1 for range resolution. All we need to do is use these two facts that we know and uh, at this point I would urge you to pause the video and try and derive this expression for velocity resolution yourself. Uh, so two objects whose velocities are separated by delta v will have their angular frequencies uh, separated by a delta omega given by this expression over here where uh, Tc is the uh, separation between uh, adjacent uh, chirps. And from the properties of uh, discrete Fourier transforms, we know that two frequencies can be resolved uh, as long as their separation delta omega is more than 2 pi by n. So now uh, substituting uh, uh, this expression over here and rearranging this a little bit, we get this following inequality uh, which gives us an expression for the velocity resolution and note that this expression here n the number of chirps times the um, uh, duration between adjacent chirps uh, is actually equal to the total frame time so uh, finally we get this expression for the velocity resolution uh, which basically says that the resolution uh, the velocity resolution of the radar is inversely proportional to the frame time and is given by lambda by twice the um, uh, frame time. Time for a question now. These two frames have the same length, uh, frame length tf, but the frame corresponding to radar A has twice the number of chirps compared to the frame corresponding to radar B. The question is, what can you say about the maximum me measurable velocity and the velocity resolution of these two frames? This brings us to the end of the third module. In the next module, we are going to use all that we've learned so far with respect to range and velocity estimation to design a transmit signal which meets certain specified requirements.